Okay, welcome everyone to workshop two um, on learning design by, um, by myself, Nicola Pallet, and my colleague uh, Yolanda Morkel. And I thought if the group, if you can just share a little bit, you know, who you are and where you're from in the chat, that would be great. Um, I'm sure there are some of you who don't know one another. Okay. Um, Tony, I have started the recording. So in session one, for the I mean, for those of you who have joined us, just a quick recap. Um, we looked at the design process and wicked problems. So we said that this, the design process is iterative; it's not linear. And design thinking is about a mindset. It's not a method. It's about being innovative and not procedural. We spoke a lot about um, the the template trap and how. A design thinking approach to learning design um, can help us to uh, move back and forth between various um, sort of stages and sort of it's about the thinking process rather than this linear sequence. And Yolanda, do you want to say a bit more about this? I know you love this model. So I'm going to mute my mic. Yes, I think just to add um, uh, to, to what you've already said, Nicola, Lawson's idea that rather than moving from a problem in a linear fashion to a solution, we look at the problem space and the solution space as two different spaces that are negotiated between through analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. So Lawson is saying that as we develop closer to the solution, the problem actually crystallizes. So we never leave the problem behind and move on to the solution. The problem in how it is redefined and framed actually forms part of how you develop the solution. Thanks so much, Yolanda. I just know that she can say that a whole lot better than I can. <laughs> um, OK, so moving on. We'd really like for you guys to share any insights from workshop one. So what were the takeaway um, points for you? If you could share those in the chat, that would be awesome. Okay, so the objectives for this workshop is about that space between the problem and the solution. And we look at strategies to help you negotiate between the space. And this is called um, known as the ideation or conceptualization phase. Nicola. Um, sorry, Yolanda, I'm going to hand over to you. All right. Um, yes, the, the idea that um, we, we dwell in a space that um, is open-ended and quite... Um, um, divergent um, is very important in the early stages of the design. Uh, ideation and conceptualization, they, they mean the same thing. Um, it's, it's the formation of ideas or concepts where those ideas or concepts are mental representations. They, they hint at possibility. They're abstract ideas or abstract objects. Um, some people call them holding ideas. Uh, they capture the promise of a project, so they're not finite, they're not, um, they're not detailed, uh, they're quite open-ended and, and abstract. They, um, in fact, are more about what you do than what you think, and in the sense that um, ideas are quite fuzzy, and if you if you don't act on them, put them out there, even if they're silly, even if they're ridiculous, um, uh, put them out there and test them, talk about them. More, the more ideas, the better. Um, the best way to have a good idea is to have lots of ideas. And sometimes it's about the, the um, crazy ideas or the unusual connections that we make. I hope I'm a little bit uh, more clear now. I'm just speaking into my mic a little bit more. Thanks, Rita. So ideation as, as a very difficult process, um, but 
but a process that uh, is very necessary um, in the design. Uh, they are initially quite divergent, uh, so we we don't we don't we're not critical. You must you, you think um, of of crazy ideas, put them out there. You can always test them later. You explore them. Um, that bottom graphic shows the ideation phase as the wide part of the funnel. Later on, you can you can adjust them, you can refine them, you can throw them out. But it's really important to, to, to be free in this first stage so that you don't limit the possibilities. The next strategy that we're going to touch on, and we'll show you in the, in the next slide how and where everything fits in, is that we use the idea of a precedent. A precedent is, is referring to past experience. Now, often we do this intuitively. We think of, of learning interventions that have happened before, that either worked or didn't work. But we want to suggest that you actually use this strategy as an active uh, part in the process where you critically look at precedent and you extract from those precedents principles that may be applied in the next design. So you don't have to copy exactly what what you understand in the precedent, but you rather formulate the broad principles that can be transferred to a similar problem. So so what we do is we look for examples that may present similar um, a situation with similar uh, learners, for example, or similar learning goals or simil similar possible content or a learning intervention that is in a similar setting to the problem that you are confronted with or where you recognize similar possible methods or tools or sim similar possible assessment strategies and you build a library of, of uh, and a vocabulary of, of um, things, aspects that have worked or not worked before and you then actively apply those principles uh, to your to your design. And as I've said before, this is a process. We will touch on this in the next workshop uh, on Friday. Um, so just to, to, to talk a little bit about what a precedent is, because we refer to it um, later on. Well, in fact, in the next slide, I can just show you that um, in the previous workshop we spoke about this iterative process of discover, define, ideate, develop, evaluate and implement. And of course in the first early stages of design we focus on discover, define and ideate. Last week we looked at problem finding. So we, we framed the problem and that links with, with uh, the step or act of discovery. Now we want to suggest that as part of your research, in defining the problem even further, you do a precedent study. So you look at past um, learning interventions and projects. Awesome. And through, through that, and, and, and there are many other things that you can use as well, you formulate guiding principles. So you talk about what must this learning intervention do or not do, the how and the where and the why and the when. So when you then ideate, and that is the stage where you really brainstorm and you think of crazy ideas and you make uncomfortable connections and you, you really put out um, a series of, of um, ideas, analogies, concepts, you then can go back to those guiding principles and test them to see whether they're actually answering to the principles that you had formulated initially that you wanted the project to achieve. So through ideation, we, we refer back to the, the problem. Remember we said earlier that, that we always toggle between the problem and the solution space. Um, and, and as you consider different concepts, you may reframe the, the, pro the problem, actually redefine the problem as you, as you move along. Right, I'm going to hand over to Nick. Thanks so much, Yolanda. Apologies that I actually I was I was cut off so abruptly. Um, 
but okay so back to the outcomes for today we're going to um, we hope that by the end of it you'll be able to understand this ideation phase a bit more as part of this design process and as Yolanda um, mentioned now it's about that toggling process um, in order to do this we also need to use guiding principles um, as part of the stage and we will also draw on, you know, we go back to the problem finding and looking at um, the precedent analysis. So it's about how you use the guiding principles throughout these different phases. And these are actually strategies within the ideation phase. Um, and we'll also look at considering various concept analogies for a wicked problem. So remember the example we had in from workshop one, which was HIV AIDS training um, in a corporate context. So we're going to use that example again and test them against some guiding principles. Um, okay. So, and we'll also look at various when we talk about um, the, the concepts like um, as analogies we'll actually be referring to that example that we introduced as a live brief from workshop one. Okay, so here's just a little reminder of the live brief. So it's for corporate HIV AIDS training. And this is actually, what we mean by a, a live brief is this is a real example. So in workshop three, will actually have some a guest presenter. I think I'm actually spoil, spoiling the surprise, Yolanda, and I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, but it was in our teaser for workshop three um, that uh, Billy Moritz will come and join us and talk about this and what their solution was. Um, Okay, so if you can't read this here, it's about a large corporate client that approaches your learning design team to design a learning experience intervention to educate staff on HIV AIDS. There are 3,000 employees spread across two cities and five sites need to be trained. The objective of the training is to train staff to be aware of health issues related to HIV AIDS, to address the stigma and to change their mindset about the epidemic. The target audience consists of knowledge workers, mostly graduates. They have limited exposure to e-learning, and previous e-learning exposure was for compulsory compliance training. Employees are based in different departments and represent a range of age groups from early 20s to mid 40s. The time commitment, though, should be no more than one hour. Okay, so we in the, for activity one, we looked at the other kinds of, you know, what extra information do you need from the client so what are the wicked problems you identify um, and how do you make sense of all this information so here's a lovely sketch note that my colleague Yolanda did and this is what we've discovered so far and, and these are you know we, we drew on the text chat from workshop one so your responses and we included this in the sketch note over here so, um, you know, the idea of what, so what kind of learning, what is relevant, um, and then how many employees, okay, who they are, so looking in, in detail a bit more into language, uh, background, what do they already know, um, what kinds of this compliance training was successful, is there something you can draw on? And then why was because their awareness of the stigma. So what we're actually doing here to make sense of the wicked problem is to map it to the what, who, why, where, how, and when. So a lot of the questions you had actually fall, fall into these over here. Okay, so also the different departments and the five sites, where is it going to be? Is it online, blended? An important question was how mobile are the staff? in this company. Okay, so we can look at this a little bit more I think on our uh, Facebook group because we'll need to, when we're discussing the concepts, return back to these wicked problems. Okay, so what is a guiding principle? Okay, so we all have many, many ideas um, but it's got to do with how we select them, sort of criteria that we use. To, to, to select various solutions. 
So in the, I was wondering, in the chat, what would you regard as some of the guiding principles for this? So when you're choosing a solution. I don't know if I... I think I could possibly have said that more clearer. clearer. Um, yes. Thank you, Yolanda. So what are the criteria? The learning intervention must be what? So must it be, for example, let's say it's got to be short. We know they only have one hour. So is your main guiding principle going to be time? Which other guiding principles can you see from this? Yeah, please use the chat. <laughs> okay, so the past example here would be the compliance training. Okay, was that effective? What worked? Perhaps there was some feedback on that training that you could incorporate and uh, use to improve on the HIV training. Okay, interesting, Rita. So that's got to do with the content. So it's about the what. Yeah, so you're responding to the group. So the who are our learners and what. Or in this case, who are the employees. Yes, so the mobility. Are they in an office? Um, or are they traveling? Are they on the road? So we'd also actually need to know a bit more about these sites, uh, where the employees are working. Yes, exactly. I agree, Marta. So if you get more, um, once you start getting more information, you can start populating the, you know, the principles. I mean, you can, and then your your guiding. You, that actually, the more information you have, helps you to refine the guiding principles, which then feed into, you know, that these will be the criteria that you use as a strategy when you're ideating between the problem and solution space. So I think even from this example, you guys are, you know, we're getting a sense that it's about this movement between the problem, the guiding principle, going back to the brief. I think that's also really helpful. Sometimes, um, you know, it, it's about, you know, not getting divorced from the original problem or expanding on it through your questions. Okay, so it's this idea of, you know, once you have more information, it's like a funnel or a filter. And that becomes your guiding principle. It's that narrowing down process. Okay, now I'm going to hand over to Yolanda. And we're going to start looking at concepts as analogies. Um, I think it's about um, also alternatives. Uh, you know, when you you may not have um, get answers to all the questions um, that you ask about the problem. So then, then consider different different alternatives. Thanks, Tony. I'll speak up. Um, so, so the what ifs. Say um, this: the learners are mobile. Then what? If they're not, then what? So, so it's 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 really about not pinning down your decision-making process at the moment and still diverging, um, not converging as yet. To get to concepts, um, what we do is what we suggest is that uh, we use an analogy. Now, this may seem quite strange because we're going to make quite 
funny, interesting, weird links. Um, we're going to use ideas that are not directly, obviously related to learning to help us think about the learning design. Um, and these are concepts that are quite open-ended and you can read meaning into them as much um, as you want to. So what we're going to do now is Nicola and I just formulated four concepts. There are so many, many more. You can think up your own and we, we'll discuss that in the Facebook group as well. Um, just to illustrate to you the process, by using four different concepts, how can we use these concepts to guide our thinking towards defining or developing um, an idea that is appropriate to our particular learning challenge? Nicola, to do the first one. Please, please continue um, adding in the chat while we talk. Yeah, great. Please, guys, you'll add your own concepts. So concepts are kind of like, um, well, what's the term in English classes, you know, metaphor or simile. If you use like or as, it's a simile. Otherwise, it's a metaphor. Anyway, it's basically a comparison. And you're saying the learning experience that you envision these um, corporate employees to have is like a what? You know, is it like sitting around a campfire? And now you think about features of a campfire. Well, it's social, it's got this open-ended time frame, it's relaxed, it's informal, there's no stress. Um, you know, it's got to do with storytelling, so connecting with people through storytelling. And what images and things come to mind in education when you think about campfires? Okay, it's like peers, a peer assessment, um, experiential. Okay, so you can take it as far as you want. Um, so any other ideas that emerge for you guys? Yes, a relaxed learning adventure. So you might have multiple, you might be traveling, and you could have multiple campfires at the different stops. Um, so it's about, I think, taking things as, as far as you want. Your, like your ideas can run away with you. It's a very um, sort of a fluid and creative process when you come up with concepts. Um, yes, at the campfire is also a very non-threatening experience. Um, <laughs> a marshmallow fry, why not? Okay. And what would be your marshmallows in the learning experience? Yes. So Tony's got a good point. Remember, one of our guiding principles was time. So it's really hard to get this um, this kind of learning experience when you only have one hour. <laughs> oh, so Carolyn, those are the marshmallows, the rewards. Nice. Um, and this is what we're going to be discussing a bit more in the Facebook group. Um, will really run away with some of these concepts. Uh, and what about learning design as a treasure hunt? This is another concept. So what comes to mind when you think of the learning experience you're designing as a treasure hunt? <laughs> yes, the amazing race. Good one, Rita. So you can already start thinking about, okay, the employees in the, you know, five sites in the two different cities, maybe there's some sort of comp competition, uh, like a gamification. Um, is it about this competitive element? Will there be, uh, you know, is it only about the, the hunt? Is it going to be a short duration? Um, you know, how is even if you're talking about a hunt or you could talk about a treasure map? You know, is how does a map different differ from the hunt? Maybe the map is pre-structured con structured content, where the hunt is, you know, actually doing something. It's intense, um, and it's got a particular time frame and ends with a, you know starts at a starting point and has a end end point as well. Okay, cool. So we've already got some great ideas here. 
Okay, so Rita's got a good point here. Survivor, but it's HIV AIDS training. So is it suited to the topic? So we've got a lot of engagement here. Um, and it's really great because I think you, it's that sense that this is a fun, creative process. And when you're working with your own um, learning designs, it's, it's a very useful exercise, um, I think, to play with and to get discussion started. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Yolanda to take you through the next concepts and to think around those. Thanks, Nicola. Um, the next one that we thought we could uh, talk about is the shopping center experience. How would a uh, learning experience be if you had to compare it to a shopping experience? I don't know how you guys shop. <laughs> would it be linear, self-directed, all over the show? Um, do you know what it is that you want? So you shop with a list. Do you shop alone? Do you bump into people? Is it just about collecting the learning? It's just about picking up on stuff and filling your basket? Um, is there any, any link between the things that you want to perhaps bake a cake and so you, you've got a list and, and uh, predetermined things that you collect? Do you have choice as a learner? Those kinds of things, I think, for shopping experience would be different to sitting around a campfire and totally different to the experience of a treasure hunt. Or for perhaps, for some people, it's quite similar to a treasure hunt or an amazing race. Right, so these budget considerations. Yes. Think about, about the learner choice. And learner autonomy in the learning process. Tony shops with the search engine, gets the stuff delivered. Yeah, I, I just assumed one kind of shopping experience, and you're quite right. It could be an online shopping experience. How would that be different from, from going to a shop and parking your car and getting out and getting a trolley and all of those things? Yeah, so is it for, for uh, necessities, getting bread and milk, or uh, the kind of sp spoiling shopping experience uh, that Nicola is referring to for the wardrobe? New things or the, the tried and tested list? So how, how would that be appropriate or not for, for AIDS, HIV and AIDS training? We, we can discuss this. In the Facebook group, I think there's going to be a lot of of discussion, and and again, frame the response as you know linked to the to the to the analogy of the problem. So if it is an online shopping experience, it might mean this or that, and if it is something else, it might mean something totally different. So you you you. You go to a shop and you buy what you need and you leave and you go home. All right, so the, yeah, again, linking to the problem and the guiding principles. Um, I think I'm going to go on to the next one because we're just introducing these concepts. We want you to add more and we're going to expand on them in the, in the Facebook group. Another analogy that I want to hand over to is the, the speed date. Yeah, I know this analogy sounds very funny, um, <laughs> but it's often we think about, you know, you've only got a short amount of time to make an impact, but it's very sometimes surface level. I don't know who's been on a speed date yet. Please, or, or what do you think a, a speed date is like? If you're going to say that a learning experience is like a speed date. Never been. Okay, a 
blind date and how is a blind date different to a speed date okay maybe a speed date you it's sort of the immediacy you see the person you know what you're you're in for a blind date you probably don't know from the start um, okay so Marta says it's short gets the job done fast joy also not um, okay Carolyn yeah but in as much as possible <laughs> oh. interesting so even if you were going to look at the, the broader concept of dating there'd be different concepts <laughs> within those um, oh can you prepare for a speed date interesting question Yolanda ah Okay, so it's the is it the superficiality? Um, I have actually read up on speed dates, and some people um, they can decide whether or not to give out their number for you know and to to rate someone. Say they are romantically, they could be romantically interested in this person. They'd like to be friends with this person, or they connected over you know similar you know shared interests. Maybe they have a similar job. Um, so for networking. So is there a, a potential for followed up uh, follow up conversation and engagement? Okay. So that might be very small. Okay, so it's a two way, so only two people can talk at a time. Okay. Good point. Yes. So Rita says there are numerous guiding principles here. So the guiding principles um, are not just the time here, yeah, but uh, I think that the nature of the interaction. Are you engaging, and that you uh, and that you can't do it alone. So the blind, whether it's a blind date or a speed date, that's always you know in partnership with someone. Okay, but we can also we can chat about this more. Um, okay, give through basic truths. What I like is that it's very, you know, it's, it's a sort of a wild card uh, concept and yet it enables us to have this very interesting discussion around the learning, compa comparing it to a learning experience and um, possibilities, you know, of how it aligns with various guiding principles. Okay. So even we look at their tables as well. Um, you said not. Sue says not a lot of peripheral information. Um, you know, people just have a drink. Um, it's not very. It's mainly that the attention is on the person. Yeah, and analogies. I like that, um, Yolanda. It's about helping us to not fall back on known ideas and pushing our thinking. And I think in academia, um, it's also that that freeing our thinking that allows yeah you know, that allows us to make these these links. Okay. So now we're going to go back to this is what our our activity is. Um, it's basically on our Facebook page looking at two of the most appropriate, what, what you consider to be the most appropriate concepts uh, to explore in relation to the live brief. Um, <laughs> live brief. Was it the speed date? Was it the campfire? Was it the treasure hunt? 
um, which do you think is the most appropriate? And then go back to the problem and the brief and consider the different um, guiding principles. You can use the, uh, dis uh, discuss the ones that we've already referred to, or you could add your own. So you might have a concept um, that you feel works even better than these. So what analogy would you use to represent the learning experience you want to create for these corporate employees? Okay. We're also open to you guys sharing your own learning design on our Facebook group. So you can position it as a brief. Okay, so we've got the example of the HIV AIDS training, um, but perhaps you also have a learning design in mind. Um, and you can share whether you have engaged in the problem finding um, and discuss the process and what you've identified, possibly engaging in some ideation, because um, we really welcome peer feedback. So we can look at one another's learning designs and also, like Rita said, how she used um, the wicked problems idea in uh, training. Even things like that, not just maybe learning design, but how you've used ideas um, from the workshop in your own setting. I think that will be really exciting and interesting, um, especially for us carrying this work uh, forward. Um, check here. So we're going to continue the conversation in our Facebook group um, and I'm going to hand over to you and, and the link is over here. I can add it in the chat again and I think I'm going to hand over to Yolanda to tell you a bit more about prep, um, what's going to happen in workshop three. Thanks Nicola. Yes, um, somebody did say earlier that, you know, in going through these analogies, we actually, we refer to precedent. I mean, you can, you can also define precedent in, as a concept. So, I just added in the text chat, I, I would be interested to, to hear what you guys say, um, thinking of your own working context, the learning interventions in your own institution. What, what type of analogy would you use to best capture that experience? I think for me, the concept also opens up the idea of an experience, rather what are the tools that we're going to use and how do we actually bring the learning. It is about putting the focus back on, on the learner, bringing empathy into the whole process in, in thinking about how will people, people um, live that experience. So we're going to create uh, threads in the Facebook group. We'll do that straight away for each of those uh, concepts that, that we've just discussed. And so then we keep the conversation to each of those um, in the comments. And then we may also add new ones, or you're welcome to add, add new an analogies, concepts that we can discuss. And let's think about our HIV and AIDS example when we discuss it. Uh, let's let's ask the what if questions. Um, so there may be more than one option. We're not yet we're not yet um, converging the thinking. We're still in that space that is quite divergent and 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 open. And yes, please, um, Nicolas suggesting add an image. I think the image really helps us to to picture it. And um, then. Friday, what we're going to do Friday, now the session you might have noticed is, is quite late, it's between 6 and 7 on a Friday, so hopefully you can join us with a glass of wine or uh, something else, coffee or cappuccino or I don't know what you have on the Friday at that time, but we um, are, will be linking up with Willy Maritz from Calio, he is in Los Angeles at the moment, and that is why with the 9 hour time difference for him, it will be 9 o'clock in the morning, and we will be ready with our sundowners. So um, he, will, he will join us, and he will then present their particular learning intervention in response to this particular live brief problem. And we're going to look at that proposal as, as a precedent. So we're going to engage around the who and the what and the why and the where 
and and then we can also try and see how close our analogy um, uh, that that we've discussed and 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 chosen as the most appropriate, you know, how that links up with with their with their um, proposal. Uh, I think what we also will see is that their particular solution is related to the way that they framed the problem, and they might have framed the problem differently to how we frame the problem. And I think that that brings us back to Lawson's idea of you know dragging the problem along and and redefining the problem. So we will then have sort of come full circle in starting with the live brief and ending with the actual implemented precedent uh, example. Perhaps if you have questions or if something's not clear, uh, you can you can add that in the text chat. We're moving this discussion out of the forum and into Facebook because we feel that it is um, a nice space to you know for an informal discussion because we will speculate rather than give answers. We will we will um, reason or argue or think out loud, and and we feel it's Facebook is quite easy platform, appropriate platform to do that. Add anything. We've got we've got ten more minutes or so. Um, if there's question. Yes, I was just going to um, reiterate. Um, please, guys, add your questions on the chat. Um, and just to you know, this is a quite a new approach to I think learning, not well, learning design. You know, taking it. Uh, using design thinking. So for us going forward it's about, you know, is this useful? Um, and especially those of you who are involved in uh, staff development around blended learning, putting courses online, um, you know, which parts, you know, you, you know and, and also when you're working with, I, I don't know who's working with, with academics, does it give you um, perhaps a language? And have you tried any other um, learning design templates or frameworks? And what was your experience of using them? So some of you may have used uh, the Carpe Diem approach, um, or Jilly Salmon, or Grania Canole. So we're, um, please feel free to start, um, you know, to post about those as well. Um, and yes, uh, we've already shared lots of interesting resources, little YouTube clips, and things on our Facebook, um, on the Facebook group. So the official resources, or the ones we shared initially, are on the Emerge site. So the link is this over here. And for those of you who are not yet a member of the Emerge network, we encourage you, we strongly encourage you, <laughs> um, to join. Because it's a really, you know, nice community of educational technology scholars and practitioners from across the continent, um, and it's about engaging, and, and it's a, it's about being part of a community of practice. I think that that for me is one of the strengths of being part of a network like this. Um, are there any questions? See, everyone's very quiet. Or you're hungry because it's lunchtime, or some of you may have had lunchtime already. Um, okay, so just a reminder Facebook group, and our next and the final workshop is on Friday. And also, you know, we're hoping that. Although this will be workshop three, it's um, the final in the series, we hope to keep the Facebook group as a way to extend the discussions that happen in the workshop um, and the Adobe Connect space. Um, Yolanda, can I hand over to you? All right. Um, thanks, Nicola. I was, I was just thinking if, if there's any clarification perhaps needed on any of the terminology. We spoke about problem finding last week. We introduced guiding principles today. 
the idea of a, of a concept. And, and these are strategies that we suggest. We, we don't say that they need to happen in this particular sequence necessarily. Um, and early on in, in our preparation, Nicola and I spoke about, Nicola suggested, you know, what the whole idea of affordance, of how, how would that link to the guiding principles? I thought if we had time left over, perhaps we could, Nicola, you could say something about that and just ask the participants. Because these these terms come from the design discipline, and they're not they're not um, widely known in in the learning design field. So we we're borrowing terminology from from other fields, and and there may be terms that we already use, like an affordances. How how may uh, are it different from from guiding principles or assessment criteria? Um, so little discussion to finish off with, Nicola. What do you think? Yeah, thank you, Yolanda. And I'm also really happy I actually made this <laughs> little sketch note during one of the Check It um, sessions. And Pitt and Magda were there. So we were doing, we, were, we, we did the Bauer, Bauer's 2008 reading on matching affordances of tools to learning tasks. And I got to think about it and um, I thought, well, what, how is this concept, what does it work like in practice? Is it seen as a default of a technology? You know, what X tool affords that enables you to do what? Um, but maybe we needed the broader social thing and this is what I thought was you know perhaps missing that for your you need to have some guiding principles when you selecting tools so it's not just the maybe the sort of technological features or tool features of the tool in use um, whether you can comment in that space whether you can share but perhaps you know it's those bigger things is it's um, is there a cost or is it free? It's about a sustainability. Maybe it's about scale. So if we look at the training example, um, there are 3,000 people. What is the? Are your choices going to be different if you have a class of 30 or 300 or 3,000? Um, and it's sort of the the how the concepts, the affordances, and the guiding principles map or or how those concept, how those ideas relate, um, I think would be a really interesting discussion. So, do you see it as the affordances perhaps being only coming in later, or would you consider it early on in the design process? Okay. Or will yeah, will you only look at the solution um, affordances when you get to the making decisions about in the solution space? Okay, so if we could also maybe have a discussion around that um, in the Facebook group, I think that would be, could be really interesting. Um, Magda and Pitt, you guys are quite quiet. Maybe in the chat room if you'd like to share your sense of affordances so far. Or anyone else um, for that matter. So it's a very, you know, quite a, a concept that's become very popular. I know even Bill Cope um, is talking about it in new learning um, in the book and and he talks and he uses the term again in a very different way hmm oh, okay cool um, I was just yeah the question I had was just whether you found the concept of affordances useful and if you see it as features of a technology rather than something broader um, so, so it's the relationship, as I said, between affordances, guiding principles, and the concepts. Um, if we can discuss that further in the forum. Yes. So Tony's got a good point here. Often we look at, we've got to look at the problem or the challenge before we focus in on the technology. So perhaps, you know, because I know in the check it model we look at affordances relatively early, 
Whereas with a design thinking approach to learning design, when would you consider affordances? Ah, oh, nice one. So Mark has got a good point here. So you're saying actually affordances could be multi-layered. So affordances um, of a tool for a learning learning experience. Okay, and Joy, I think you're hinting that affordances might be um, contingent upon roles, whether it's an employee or or the employer. So the context that reframes the meaning. Hmm. Yes, because Yolanda and I, <laughs> we were having this discussion, well, where, where does this fit and how people are, are using it? Um, but when, you, when, when people use it, it's actually, that it's about making choices about tools. All right, I see it's three minutes to one o'clock. So I think we better just uh, continue these dis interesting discussions that we're having in the Facebook group. Um, but we'd like to say thank you so much for joining us. Um, and we really hope that a few of you will be able to join us on Friday. Um, I think it's going to be a very uh, riveting session. Um, I'm going to hand over to say goodbye, but I thank you very much all for attending. Thank you very much, everybody. I look forward to uh, continuing this discussion in the Facebook group. Thanks for attending. Okay, I'm now going to stop the recording um, and the meeting is now formally closed. So please don't forget about the Facebook group <laughs> um, and we hope to see you guys next time. Have a great day.